this this slide names are awardee, Dr. Griffiths. But I want to talk very briefly about Dr. Spranker. This is an award for excellence in research because uh, Dr. Spranker was excellent in research. And uh, that's why it's named after him. Go ahead. Uh, just his past history, he was born in upstate New York, graduated from Union College, received his MD from Hopkins, and he worked as a Harry Lane resident under Dr. Park. Uh, subsequently, he had a research fellowship at Rockefeller Institute in New York, and then was chief president at Hopkins. He actually moved to uh, Sydenham's Hospital in Baltimore, which was uh, in part based in TB therapeutics, and then later came back to be the fourth professor and chairman of pediatrics. Uh, go ahead. He worked on circulatory failure and diphtheria, autoimmunity and brain and kidney disease. He was the first to cure meningococcal meningitis with uh, sulfonilnide and did a lot of work on the epidemiology, pathophysiology and treatment of stroke. All right, so with that, um, there are other uh, residents and fellows who submitted uh, for this award, but the awardee is Megan Griffiths and she'll be introduced by Dr. Everett. Thank you so much, Ann. So there's a lot that I could tell you about, about Megan. I've worked with her for four years now. She, um, uh, she was born in South Africa. Uh, she uh, grew up in Denver, Colorado, where she went to a college and medical school and was a pediatric resident at Connecticut Children's, where she was also a, a year as a chief resident and then came here afterwards to do her cardiology fellowship. Um, and, you know, since we're really talking about research today, I, I think there's uh, a lot to be said for people's success, for being in a place and the people around them to be successful. But, you know, if you don't really have the intellectual drive and the curiosity to be able to uh, inquire and do things, then no matter what we do, uh, those opportunities are going to be squandered. And I can tell you that for, from Megan's standpoint, uh, as a first year fellow, which is incredibly busy for cardiologists, she came to the lab, learned how to do ELISA assays, submitted an abstract to uh, SPR and won the best clinical uh, abstract uh, that year. Uh, she went on and competed and became a pediatric scientist development program award winner. They only give out five a year in the country. And not only do you have to submit a fantastic clinic, uh, research proposal, you have to interview with two pediatric chairs from across the country. So you can imagine how challenging that had to be. Uh, she won that and she spent two years in the lab, but to, to, to be able to participate in that program, she had to do absolutely no clinical time. In fact, the person told me that, I don't care if all the cardiologists die in a plane crash on the way to AHA, Megan's not doing any clinical work. And so we, um, uh, but to do that, that meant that Megan had to do all three years of her clinical work in two years of her fellowship. So you can imagine how difficult that was to do. But in the past two years working in the lab, I, I just checked a few minutes ago, she's already published six papers as first or, or, a, uh, or as a second author on it as a uh, equal contributor. She has two papers already uh, under review. So I, hopefully by the time she moves to uh, Columbia to do her advanced PH fellowship, she's gonna have eight papers uh, published as a first author here from Hopkins. So that just tells you in a nutshell about the amount of drive and curiosity that Megan has and why she's been so successful. And is gonna talk about some of that today in her grand rounds. Uh, and also her uh, kind of reveal her experiences of developing a data science as well. So I'll turn this over to Megan.
Gosh. Uh -huh. Thank you so much, uh, both Dr. Murphy and Dr. Everett for, for having me here today. I'm so, I feel so privileged and honored to have received this award. Uh, and it's just been such a privilege to work here at Hopkins the last couple of years. So, I'm very excited today to talk to you about my work in proteomic approaches to pulmonary vascular disease. I have no conflicts of interest, uh, but I am funded by the PSDP. So I'd like to start today with a story. So this is my mom, and this is her best friend, my Auntie Diana. Uh, now. One day, unfortunately, my mom called me to tell me that my Auntie Diana was diagnosed with breast cancer. And she wasn't diagnosed with just any breast cancer. My mom told me she was diagnosed with her two new positive breast cancer. That, by the way, is the human epidermal growth receptor type 2. Now, my mom is not a molecular, molecular biologist. She and my Auntie Diana are not physicians. They are, in fact, both excellent attorneys. But nonetheless, they knew the importance of this specific diagnosis, that this was a precision diagnosis, that by having the HER2 new specific diagnosis, there were implications for her disease severity and also specific molecular targeted therapies. That brings the idea of precision medicine, which is a term thrown around a lot these days. What that really means is customizing diagnosis and treatment based on specific characteristics of a patient and their disease, and using molecular and genetic information to risk stratify, think about their severity, and thus target therapy to their specific disease. And ultimately, our goal is to be patient-centered and have better outcomes. So an example of this is let's say you were to take a heterogeneous group of people who all seem to have the same disease, say pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, how can we think about how to treat each of them? Well, a genetic diagnosis exists for some of them, but what about the rest of them? Well, I would suggest that we can understand the molecular characteristics of their disease by looking at protein expression of where, where their disease is at that moment in time. And that gives you the idea of something called a proteotype, which is what type of their, what, what is their specific expression and protein type of their disease. And doing that, I think we can better stratify our patients into their particular type of disease. And we can even re-stratify those with a genetic diagnosis. Unfortunately, that's not the current state of the art in pulmonary hypertension. Right now, it's a little bit more, I'm a hammer, everything looks to me like a nail. What we can do is we can describe hemodynamics for our patients with cardiac catheterization. We can follow their ventricular function using an echocardiogram or nt p And we even nowadays have three to four classes of medications to use. Unfortunately, they all target vasodilation, kind of the same pathway. Given the paucity of mechanistic therapies, our guidelines now suggest that risk assessment is a key, key component for pulmonary hypertension management. If we know their severity, we can titrate their therapy. Unfortunately, there are no pediatric specific risk assessment tools. So today, I would like to explain uh, some pulmonary arterial hypertension development, discuss the evaluation of pulmonary arterial hypertension, PAH, review some mechanistic pathways in PAH, and then talk about a multi-marker precision approach to disease severity. So pulmonary hypertension is defined by a mean pulmonary artery pressure of at least 20 millimeters mercury, 
and a pulmonary vascular resistance index of at least three woods units times meter squared. There's multiple subtypes. Group one pulmonary arterial hypertension is really the vascular disease subtype. This is a disease at the capillary or small arterioles. And is probably the one that most of us think about when we think about things like PPHN or congenital heart disease. Group two is disease associated with left heart disease. This is pulmonary hypertension caused by say heart failure or pulmonary vein stenosis, mitral valve disease. Group three, I think, is one we're actually really familiar with in pediatrics, and that is lung disease. This is what happens to our NICU babies who get bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or some of the pulmonary hypertension that happens to our patients with a congenital diaphragmatic hernia uh, or uh, renal agenesis. Group four is a small but really interesting group of chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension called CTEF. And group five is kind of the catch-all multifactorial. Today, I'm really just going to focus on group one, pulmonary arterial hypertension. And as I mentioned, this is really a vascular disease. It's a disease that happens at the alveolar capillary interface in the lungs. And there are many different proximate causes for this that ultimately lead to a similar pathobiology. So hypoxia or hypercarbia causing vessel constriction, inflammation, uh, infection, sepsis, increased flow from shunts, and then of course, genetic predispositions or idiopathic disease. But ultimately what happens is that these vessels constrict uh, or get smaller. And in the setting of that constriction, there's turbulent or higher pressure blood flow. And that process in and of itself potentiates disease. The high pressure causes damage to the vessel wall and inflammation on the vessel wall. How does the blood vessel respond? Well, vascular hyperproliferation, so abnormal angiogenesis, fibrosis, and essentially you go from having a nice, open, elastic, compliant uh, arterial with lots of space for blood to go through to this thick, non-compliant, stiff uh, artery with much, much smaller diameter, much higher resistance, and in severe cases, even fixed obstruction. Now, this really isn't just a disease of the lungs. The, one of the major things uh, is the pulmonary vascular disease effect on the heart. In the setting of this thick, stiff, non-compliant vessel, the right ventricle has to pump against much higher pressure. When it's pumping against much higher pressure, the walls will hypertrophy, the cardiomyocytes will grow and, to try and compensate, but eventually the ventricle will actually dilate and start to fail. There's another thought where this pulmonary vascular disease causes direct biochemical insults. So the problems and the disease in the pulmonary vasculature itself translates into downstream injury to the heart, resulting in a stiffer heart, more fibrosis, uh, dysfunction, and eventually heart failure. And in fact, the best predictor of adverse outcomes in pulmonary hypertension is cardiac function. So I think we all know this is a somewhat rare disease, although in the hospital, sometimes it feels a little bit less rare. It's only about one in 500 pediatric hospitalizations, but these kids are sick and they have a threefold higher mortality in the ICU compared to their general pediatric ICU, uh, we'll say colleagues or cohort and a persistent five-year mortality of between 25 and 40%. So I mentioned evaluating pulmonary hypertension. How do we do this? Well, it's a multifactorial process. The first step or the gold standard is cardiac catheterization. Uh, in the cardiac cath lab, we're able to measure right atrial pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary vascular resistance, we can also directly measure uh, cardiac function. 
We can follow these patients non-invasively with an echocardiogram. Uh, with that, we can qualitatively assess right ventricle pressure or, and right ventricular function. We can also take a guess at what the pressure is using the tricuspid valve regurgitation. And then we can look at these patients' functional status with a six-minute walk test or a stress test. You may have seen, that means either getting on a treadmill or you may have seen people walking up and down in the hallway on the main floor outside the cardiology office. Our one biochemical marker right now is NT pro BNP, which I will talk about, uh, but this is a marker of cardiac stretch or dysfunction. And then when it comes to risk stratification, there are some good scores for the adults, the big one being what's called the reveal score. Now the reveal score is a multi-factor score. It combines demographics, uh, functional status with WHO functional class, uh, walk test, uh, BNP or pro-BNP, echocardiogram, pulmonary function tests, and right heart cath. And all this together does give you a quite comprehensive assessment, but it's not very pediatric specific or really very pediatric friendly. They haven't yet let me put any of the toddlers on a treadmill and definitely not an exercise bike. And if anyone sees any of the NICU babies walking the six minute walk test downstairs, please let me know because we should probably publish that. But most of all, uh, all of this is really rather invasive. It's... So I would ask, is there a more non-invasive approach? In our lab, uh, we're hypothesizing that tissue and cell type specific proteins are a good way to find precision disease biomarkers. And the way we go about finding this is we start with some discovery. We use a disease model or tissue or blood from patients with the disease. We identify some specific tissue protein, uh, tissue or specific proteins. And then we try and verify in the blood of patients with that disease. So what we've been working on and what I've been working on the last few years is precision profiling of pulmonary hypertension. We're using what's called the NHLBI PAH Biobank. This is a large repository of about, right now, about 2,905 patients, all with group one pulmonary hypertension, uh, who have general, generously given us uh, their demographic information, pH type, we have their genetic information, treatment information, uh, and blood. And with that, Blood, we've been able to measure these five markers, NT pro BNP, ST2, HDGF, IL-6, and endostatin. And I'm wondering if putting all of this together, we can get maybe a sensitive diagnostic screening test, but maybe a better assessment test to look at severity and survival. Ultimately, our goal would be to tailor therapy. Now, how do we do this? It's actually pretty cool. So we have a custom multiplex assay where we can measure all five of these analytes together. And this actually uses only 25 microliters of serum, which is the equivalent of a finger stick of blood or in pediatrics, a heel stick. So actually pretty easy. And over the last four years, we've progressively and iteratively evaluated each of these markers, each one reflecting a different pulmonary hypertension pathway that I will go through here in a moment. And our goal is to find a comprehensive way of reflecting all of these major pathways together to give a more comprehensive understanding of disease. So the first marker I'm gonna talk about is NT pro BNP. This is the one you've probably all heard of. This is the current clinically used uh, marker and it is really a cardiac dysfunction and dilation marker. This is released in the setting of myocardial stretch and being an atriuretic peptide, the point of NT pro BNP is to get you to dump fluid. If your ventricle is dilated, it's your natural Lasix. The big problems with NT pro BNP in pediatrics, however, is that there's a lot of age related variability. It can be affected by other illnesses, especially renal function. 
there's very dynamic day-to-day -day variability. And one of the biggest issues is what I would call a threshold effect, where at a certain level of NT pro BNP, it doesn't really change anything. The risk is kind of the same. So if your patient comes in with an NT pro BNP of 40,000 and a couple days later, it's down to 20,000, we all think this is so great. This patient must be getting better. But realistically, those are both so high that their risk really hasn't changed. The biggest issue with NT pro BNP in uh, pulmonary hypertension though, is that it's cardiac specific. It's really a downstream marker and doesn't tell you about the pulmonary vasculature. So one of my favorite markers is something called ST2. This small little peptide is a member of the interleukin-1 receptor family, and it's available in two forms. There's a circulating or soluble form and a transmembrane or bound form. And the ligand for it is interleukin-33. So the way this works is that in the setting of, say, vascular stress, pressure overload, inflammation, the endothelial cells produce IL-33. And that IL-33 should bind to the transmembrane ST2 receptor in the heart. And when IL-33 binds to the transmembrane ST2 receptor, it inhibits a bunch of pathways that would ultimately cause ventricular hypertrophy, fibrosis, and ultimately heart failure. Now, if there's a lot of soluble ST2 floating around, that soluble ST2 binds up all of that IL-33. IL-33 is no longer available to bind the transmembrane ST2 receptor. And since you've now kind of inhibited the inhibitor, those pathways are now available to eventually cause uh, ventricular hypertrophy and ventricular fibrosis. So this marker has actually gotten a lot of attention as a cardiac marker, but the question is, where does it come from? Well, in our lab, we took cells from lungs. These are lungs from explanted patient, uh, explanted lungs from pulmonary hypertension or control lungs. And we grew the vascular specific cells. So vascular smooth muscle and endothelial and tested them for ST2. And what we found is that number one, the endothelial cells are what's secreting ST2 more than the smooth muscle cells. We confirmed that with RNA-seq where the endothelial cells were expressing ST2 more than the smooth muscle cells. But most importantly, the pulmonary hypertension endothelial cells were making a lot more ST2 than uh, the control cells. So what's happening here is the diseased pulmonary vasculature is making ST2, which is then having an adverse effect on the heart. Not surprisingly, when you look at this with outcomes, higher ST2 is associated with adverse outcome. This curve is from my colleague, Dr. Katherine Simpson, where she showed that higher ST2 is associated with a shorter time to death or transplant. And in our pediatric cohort, we found again, that higher ST2 was associated with worse outcomes. So ST2 is a very interesting marker in kind of a new paradigm of a biochemical insult, something being produced by the pulmonary vasculature that's having a direct downstream negative effect on cardiac function. And I mentioned risk scores repeatedly. Can we use this in a risk score? Well, we tried. Uh, we used the adult reveal score in our pediatric cohort and calculated reveal scores for all these children. And then we added or subtracted points based on the uh, ST2 level, whether it was high or low. And we compared our model, the reveal score plus ST2, to the baseline reveal score. And we found that even in this pediatric cohort, when we added ST2, we actually got the reveal score to be much more sensitive and specific and function much better for picking up adverse events in these children. So 
Another really interesting marker is interleukin-6. This is one that's gotten, I think, a lot of press this year with COVID. But what it really is, it's an inflammatory marker being an in interleukin, and it's thought to be released by macrophages. But what we do know is that IL-6 actually triggers smooth muscle hypertrophy in the vasculature. So again, where does it come from? So our lab, again, looked at those same lung cells and found that ST2 is coming from smooth muscle cells, actually. So it does come from macrophages, but it's also coming from vascular smooth muscle. And specifically, when we looked at pulmonary hypertension versus controls, you can see that uh, IL-6 is being produced specifically by the vascular smooth muscle in pulmonary hypertension. So this, again, fits into that model of this isn't an exogenous uh, or external injury to the vascular smooth muscle. The diseased pulmonary vasculature is actually producing IL-6 that is then worsening the disease. And again, when we look at outcomes, you can see that IL-6 above uh, or higher IL-6 levels are associated with shorter time to adverse outcome in both this is the adults and here are the pediatrics. So I've talked a little bit about things that cause smooth muscle hypertrophy or smooth muscle damage, but what about angiogenesis? Our kids are growing. So endostatin is a very interesting little molecule. It's an angiostatic peptide. What that means is it's a small protein that inhibits vessel growth or angiogenesis. And it's a cleavage product of collagen 18. What it ultimately does is it inhibits vascular endothelial growth factor, VEGF, and reduces blood vessel growth. Now, when we looked at that in children, we found that endostatin was much higher in our pulmonary hypertension group compared to controls. But interestingly, especially as a cardiologist, endostatin is highest in our congenital heart disease patients. And even when we compared to control non-pulmonary hypertension patients with congenital heart disease, you can see them right here, endostatin was much higher in the pulmonary hypertension group. And most in interestingly, it was highest in those with a high pressure or ventricular level shunt. The other thing we were able to look at is endostatin changes over time. So we looked at patients whose pulmonary hypertension improved. These are patients whose cardiac function got better, their pulmonary artery pressures dropped. And in those patients, endostatin actually decreased, suggesting that this may be a marker that we can use to follow our patients long-term to see if they're improving or worsening. <clears throat> What's so extra interesting to me though, is that endostatin isn't just inhibiting vascular growth in the lungs. It has an adverse effect on the heart as well. So Dr. Paul Hassoun and Dr. Rachel Damico here at Hopkins have shown that in patients with higher endostatin, there is reduced coronary capillary density. So endostatin appears to be inhibiting coronary angiogenesis. What that means is that just when the heart is trying to work harder, having to push against higher resistance, having cardiomyocyte hypertrophy and needs more blood, the effect of endostatin is that there's less coronary capillary blood flow and the heart is therefore getting less blood. So not surprisingly, again, endostatin is also associated with worse survival. These are both pediatric cohorts where higher endostatin is associated with a shorter time to death or transplant. But more importantly, we actually looked at endostatin in addition to NT pro BNP and found that endostatin, higher endostatin, actually picked up some subjects who would have been missed by NT pro BNP alone. So in this group, these subjects here all had a very low NT pro BNP, but nonetheless had events, I think in all cases, death endostatin actually picked them up. So 
using endostatin and NT pro BNP together was better than just either one of those alone. The last marker I want to talk about is something called HDGF or hepatoma derived growth factor. And this is a uh, protein that is expressed in the small vessels of pulmonary vasculature. We think it is a vascular growth factor. And we think that this is helping uh, growth of vascular smooth muscle in the lungs. But the other thing it's also doing is helping the actual little tubules form that are needed for angiogenesis. So my colleague Jun Yang has been looking at this in a rat model of pulmonary hypertension. This right here I can show you is the artery and the pink staining is HDGF. So you can see there's not very much. Contrast that to the artery in the pulmonary hypertension lung. And you can see number one, that this vessel wall is extremely thick. And this is a hypermuscularized artery with lots of smooth muscle hyperproliferation. But it's also expressing large, large amounts of HDGF, which you can see here in this pink stain. So we've talked about, about each of these markers individually and what mechanistic pathways they're involved in, whether they be inflammation, smooth muscle and endothelial hyperproliferation, abnormal angiogenesis, vascular fibrosis, cardiac fibrosis, or cardiac dysfunction. But the question really is, if we look at them together, can we better understand the disease and better risk stratify the disease? So our next step is a non-invasive multi-marker risk score. And for that, I've been using, again, the Pulmonary Arterial Hypertension Biobank, as well as a validation group from Johns Hopkins and Vanderbilt Universities. And what we've done is we've measured all five of these markers, ST2, NT pro BNP, IL-6, endostatin, and HDGF, and then built a machine learning model to cluster subjects based on marker expression. And we did multiple models. We actually did uh, just the biomarkers. We added in genetic findings, uh, age, demographics, their pH type, medications, comorbid illnesses, and found that no matter what you did, the biomarker actually resulted in the best model. We then compared our outcomes uh, for our patients based on what cluster they were in. So this is a dimension reduction plot or a TISNI plot showing uh, all of our patients clustered based on their biomarkers. And they separate out quite well. There is a little bit of leakage you can see here with the different colors, uh, but overall they're pretty good. Now, when we look at their outcomes, I would say that they separate out really well and show you there are really at least four different types of patients here based on what I'm going to call their proteotype or all of their markers together. In fact, at one year, which is about right here, people in cluster A here in the red had 23.5% mortality, while the people in cluster D here had less than 2% mortality. This suggests to me these are really, really different patients and should not be treated the same. Now, I'm always told a model doesn't count unless you're able to validate it. So this is our validation cohort. And again, the, the model actually works extremely well where these patients were all clustered out and divided based on just their biomarker expression. So I would suggest that this is a precision approach to understanding these patients' risks. We took these patients who all appear to just have pulmonary hypertension, and by looking at their protein expression, we're able to divide them and determine what is their more specific risk. Now, the other important thing is to compare to what are the current standards. The reveal score, which I've mentioned, is that multi-part risk score. And so I looked at what the outcomes look like in the reveal score. And the reveal score does work very well at separating out all of these patients. 
But I would argue that this proteomic based score works just as well, maybe a little bit better at separating out these patients. More importantly though, to get this reveal score model right here, we needed a cardiac catheterization, an echocardiogram, a stress test or six minute walk test, and a blood test. To get this proteomic based risk score, we needed a low volume blood test. So my conclusion is that by using these multiple non-invasive markers together, we can have a more comprehensive and mechanistic understanding of pulmonary hypertension pathobiology. By using this simple blood test, we can have a score that performs as well, or maybe even better than cumbersome and very invasive uh, risk profiles. And by using these minimally invasive multi-marker tools, we can improve risk stratification. This maybe gives us the opportunity to better titrate therapy in future and target specific treatments. I will say my next step is to try and model this in pediatrics because that is the one place where we really, really need a low volume specific test. I'd like to thank uh, all of my co-authors and collaborators and specifically Dr. Alan Everett, who's been my PI here for the last four years and whose support has just been unmatched and without whom I wouldn't have been able to do any of this. So uh, catch me on Twitter. And for the residents, ask me about PSDP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Megan. That was a great talk. Um, I have a question and, and then we'll hopefully have other questions coming forward. And the question is, in addition to applying this to pediatric patients with pulmonary hypertension, do you think it would be helpful in risk assessment of kids with large congenital shunts, like large VSDs um, and other types of congenital heart disease? Uh, absolutely. So given the mechanisms that we've put together here, uh, I think this is, right now I'm training it for pulmonary hypertension, but really I think we could train these couple of markers into a model for multiple different types of cardiopulmonary disease, keeping in mind that end organ uh, dysfunction of both the heart and lungs is really a final common pathway for many of these diseases. So I believe in Alan's lab or Dr. Everett's lab, we are working on uh, maybe looking at that in congenital heart disease in future. I'd also really like to look at it in just traditional heart failure, left-sided heart failure, and see if there's some utility there. Megan, Megan this is Shelby Kadi. Um, great data and wonderfully presented. We all are so proud of you. Congrats thank you. on the great work and thank you for Alan's mentorship as well. Uh, quick question, while you did this reveal and the multi uh, data modeling, what was the sample size required for running this, this machine learning models? Are you limited by this, the number of uh, data points you have or what, what are the problems you encountered and what's, you know, what do you have to say about those modeling? So it's, uh, there's a lot to go into it and I'll specifically uh, thanks Dr. Cedric Manliot. Um, here uh, in the cardiovascular center for helping me with this. Uh, so our data size is substantial. We had 2,300 or so patients uh, in addition to validation cohorts. Um, but there's, there's a few issues. Number one, these are protein biomarkers. So are they affected by age? Are they affected by the person's metabolic state at that time? We re do reduce some of that noise by having a large cohort. Um, other issues is an incident or prevalent disease. And this was a, a prevalent, so people who had disease and were on therapy. On the other hand, I'm actually looking at that as a strength where this can potentially work in, um, 
in patients who are actively being treated, which I think is a more important use than people who are being newly diagnosed. Otherwise, in terms of the machine learning approach, it's actually a, a relatively simple model, but I think going forward, uh, I would very much like to continue to train it and have it be what I guess I would call a warm model where as we get new cohorts, uh, the model is able to train and become smarter based on new information. Did great. I answer your question? You. I'm happy to talk more about it. No, no, I think that's that's great. You know, I you answered my question and I think that iteration is important and there are some newer machine learning tools which are available to work with smaller uh, numbers and smaller sample sizes. So I think you are in the right direction. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I think uh, we'll definitely be having to employ those for uh, pediatric, uh, since our pediatric cohorts tend to be much smaller. Megan, this is Maggie Moon. I want to congratulate you uh, on a really excellent presentation. And I really want to focus on the quality of the presentation itself. It was remarkable to watch. The graphics were perfect to explain what you were trying to do. And just your, your style of presentation was so clear and direct. I really enjoyed the whole thing. It's really excellent work. And I, I really appreciate your ability to, to explain it in such clarity. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Been enjoying, in, enjoying all of this work over the last few years. Um, oh, I see a question. Uh, age and sex uh, related differences in these biomarkers. So uh, actually when I added uh, age to this model, um, age didn't seem to play a huge role. That said, uh, everything I've done so far is older children or adults. Um, I have done some work on a couple of these markers and a statin and ST2 specifically with uh, Dr. Michael Colasso. And um, in our infants, specific, especially our NICU babies or say children under about three months of age, I think that there probably is uh, an age-related difference in expression, which we would need to account for in any future pediatric models. Uh, Dr. Sekar has asked, could we use this in monitoring efficacy of drug therapies or mainly for diagnosis? Uh, yes, I actually think that this would be a great uh, model for drug therapies, um, especially since there's multiple problems in pulmonary hypertension. It's somewhat of an orphan or rare disease. Um, and the outcome that we're currently working on is death or transplants, neither of which we really want to happen. So if we can easily predict that early, then yeah, that is potentially a good surrogate outcome for drugs. And the most recent drug trial that I've seen um, is the Pulsar trial, which is a new TGF beta type inhibitor. Their outcome that they used was pulmonary vascular resistance. So you have to get a cardiac cath to get that outcome in a drug trial. And PVR isn't actually associated with adverse outcomes when we look at it. So a secondary outcome that's um, especially a non-invasive outcome that can be related to uh, real, real solid adverse outcomes, I think would be very helpful. Yeah, Alan just uh, reminded me, yeah, the markers that we've chosen are all agnostic to current drug treatment pathways, so shouldn't be affected by current medications. Um, someone just asked, uh, are any of these currently used in critically ill children? Yes, uh, NT-Pro BNP is currently used uh, and is an easy to order assay here in the, here in the hospital. But as, as I mentioned, it's a little bit unstable in children, has that threshold effect. And I really don't think that it gives you the full picture. It tells you what's going on with their heart, but it doesn't tell you what's going on with everything else. I think most of the comments are a great job. <laughs> and that's from across a couple of divisions. Oh, thank you very much. Well, we're waiting to see if any last 
questions roll in. I just want to say thank you, Dr. Griffiths, fantastic presentation, and thank you to Drs. Mark and Everett for doing introductions today. I am going to show the CME information one more time for anyone who may have missed it in the beginning. I need. Yeah, I need that. <laughs> We get credit. Yeah, I was like, I'm pretty sure I get extra credit, right? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, you've gotten most of the questions, and uh, you know, you did a great job, and we appreciate it. And now I can go relax. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Murphy. All right. That was great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Moon. Good job, Megan, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Dr. Patel. Good luck. Thank you so much. All right, well with that, I think I'll end the meeting. Thank you again to everybody and everyone have a wonderful afternoon and a good rest of your week. Thank you guys. <laughs>